Well, cool. hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this new edition of 2020 Visions. My name is Neza. I'm the co-founder of Ocho Dias, and I'm going to be your host tonight. We've created this new digital space for interviews with a purpose to know and share the visions about the future that creatives have in the world. And for creatives, I mean all kinds of creatives and creativity. We know we're living hard in certain times right now. So we believe that in order to have clarity in our way to see the world of tomorrow, talking and sharing experiences, points of view, thoughts with others is super important and will help us move away from our comfort zones and expand our, our perspectives. Um, so before we start, I'd like you to tell, I'd like you to tell that uh, we'll be doing a Q&A via Slido. Just go to uh, your browser, um, slido.do, and enter, enter this code in the homepage, 63640. The cool thing about Slido is that not only you can make your questions anonymously, but you can also vote for your uh, favorite questions. Uh, and that way we can answer them according to the number of votes uh, it has. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest, Roman Vakili Tabar. Roman is the founder of Fathis Labs, a nonprofit laboratory focused on finding ways that technology and media can most effectively dismantle hatred and create understanding and compassion across lines of difference. With Pathos Labs, Roman is producing the Path Shift Summit, a convenient of the country leading academics and television writers to determine how entertainment media content, content can engineer new social norms of tolerance over hatred and unity over division. Roman has also been awarded uh, for the Erase a Hate Fellowship for NBC Universal in 2018 for his efforts to eradicate hatred in America. He spoke at one of the world's biggest stats events, has been featured in the books Two Billion Under 20 and Compassionate Careers and in journals such as UC Berkeley's and other in and belong. So Roman, thank you so much for being here with us uh, today and for your time. I gotta say this my right here, I believe it's gonna be the entrepreneur of a decade. I said it, I said it. <laughs> oh, wow, wow, that is, that is quite a statement, Nasa. And you're being recorded too, so you can't retract that statement. I'm retracting. <laughs> you're on record saying it. So if you like, we're going to warm up the conversation a little bit uh, and talk, uh, um, talk about you, your journey, and your personal interests. Um, so now that I just did like a small introduction of what do you do, um, I'd like you to tell us and explain us a bit better what do you do, how did you get to do what you do, and what's your day-to-day -day like? Yeah, totally. Well, first of all, th thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, I've been a big fan of your work for a couple of years now, and I'm so lucky to have had the chance to partner with you all on several projects. So your design style is on point, and I hope we'll have the chance to collaborate a whole lot more. Um, so yeah, I started uh, Pathos Labs a couple of years ago. And really the focus of the organization was uh, to ask the question, how can media, entertainment, technology be used to challenge the growing hatred that we're experiencing uh, in our country in the United States, but beyond uh, across the world? Um, if, if you imagine the landscape today, I mean, most people think that there, uh, there's more hatred than there has ever been. And largely, that, that's because if you look online, you see a lot of hateful messages. Uh, you see a lot of online bullying, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and people aren't necessarily um, breaking bread anymore. People aren't coming together and challenging some of these biases and misconceptions that may exist about those who are different. So, um, so technologies are a really dangerous tool in many ways, um, but we believe that technology can actually be a, a formidable tool to uh, spread empathy, to spread 
compassion and kindness across divides. Uh, and so that's what um, I set up my organization to do, uh, was just figure out ways that media and technology can really be uh, in service of challenging, growing, uh, the growing hatred, divisiveness, discord um, in, in the United States and beyond. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a little bit about us. Uh, we're an organization, a small organization that asks big questions. Um, Pathos Labs is essentially a laboratory, right? And at the end of the day, what is the point of a laboratory? The point of a laboratory is to try different things, to, to fail maybe, to, to, to test hypotheses and see, to, to see what, what works and what doesn't. And so um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying different experiments in the entertainment space, in the technology space, to create compassion and empathy. And some of the experiments may not work, but some of them may. And um, it is only by taking the experimental approach that we'll learn and we'll develop the future of what entertainment, technology, and media really looks like. So. Um, that, that, that's what we do. Um, how, how did I get to what I do? That is um, a funny question. And I think every entrepreneur will have a similar answer, which is that it was super random. I, I feel like there's no path that is uh, linear, that is straight, but rather all the paths are kind of circuitous uh, and winding. And one way you're doing this thing and then the, the next day something happens and you're doing that thing in a completely different industry. And I think what entrepreneurs have in common is the ability to respond quickly to environmental factors. Um, these these uh, variables that are completely um, out of our control. How do we respond to those? Um, that That is what entrepreneurs are good at. They find opportunities and circumstances that may be uh, difficult for some, dark for, for others. Um, the pandemic, for example, provides a, a entrepreneurs a, a huge opportunity to find ways to, to innovate and solve uh, challenges that people are, are dealing with today. So, I mean, my path in particular, I look back like four years ago, two years ago even, and I'm like, wow, I would have never had any clue that I'd be doing this kind of work today. Um, and that's kind of fun. Um, I grew up in Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado, a relatively simple life. My, my parents are immigrants to the United States. My father is from Iran. My mom is from France. Um, and um, I had the chance to, to go to pretty good schools uh, growing up. Um, I had a, a good scholarship to go to a, a private school. Um, which was not something that my, my family could have afforded otherwise. And, um, and that was a really good, lucky circumstance. Uh, I ended up going to the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder and um, was very quickly bored uh, in class and decided to leave uh, school to start uh, my first business. And that was a business where we were recording the stories and memories of older adults, typically um, in retirement communities, to document their, their life experiences uh, so that their future generations, their kids, their grandkids, their great grandkids could have uh, stories in video format uh, of, the, of their family members. Um, and so we partnered with different retirement homes in Boulder um, and uh, did that with a friend. And every weekend we'd go to a different retirement community and spend time with the individuals who were there who'd lived some really beautiful uh, lives and had a lot of uh, incredible messages to impart. Um, so that was the first business. It was uh, all over the place. I had no idea what I was doing, but, um, but uh, that led to a couple other opportunities. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's so random. Um, I met one guy who was, who was speaking at a TED talk uh, and after the TED talk, I was really inspired by what he was doing and uh, bumped into him after the event and asked if there was anything I could do to help. And lo and behold, uh, several coffee conversations later, he invites me to be a part of his team. And that leads um, me to be a part of a, a trip where we traveled around the world on a boat uh, to help entrepreneurs take their technologies to new markets. Uh, the it was this big experiment in what uh, entrepreneurship 
uh, at scale looks like? How do you scale a venture in a way that can reach new markets in a relatively little amount of time? So we were on a boat and we circumnavigated 25,000 nautical miles around the world and went to uh, 15 key port cities uh, around the world, helping these entrepreneurs uh, scale their, their technologies. And that led me to meet another guy after that who was friends with uh, the, the, the founder of that, uh, it, uh, that, it was called Unreasonable at Sea. It was a, an accelerator on a boat. And uh, so the, the founder of Unreasonable at Sea was friends with a guy who was trying to start a new university for entrepreneurs. Um, and because of my disenchantment with higher education, I was really fascinated in thinking about, you know, what does the, um, the, the, uh, the university of the future look like? And so spent several years uh, building out Watson Institute, which became the first uh, degree bearing incubator, essentially, through partnerships with uh, a couple different universities who helped us give bachelors of science degrees for uh, pursuing a business um, and so spent uh, three years of my life doing that. Um, and then the, the election in the United States happened in 2016. And I felt like uh, it was time to move on and to try to address how uh, technology and media can help reduce the hatred that was on the rise, uh, largely because of uh, the political climate in the United States. Um, so that was a very long, long answer to a uh, first question, but hopefully that provides a little bit of context. Well, that's amazing. I mean, uh, we've known each other for almost like three years or something. Wow. Has it been that long already? That's crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's been like four or, or three years. Uh, but when you talk to me uh, about your company, uh, for me at first glance was like, wow, this is this is kind of crazy, but at the same time, it's so interesting. And I, in that moment, I saw it as a very big opportunity. Um, but I don't know if, if in three years ago, you felt that Hathis, uh had that opportunity uh, in the in your in your community or in your environment. But right now, with all the situation that we're living uh, in the world, I th don't you think that this, like your idea of, of your project and your company has much more uh, sense and value? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's weird. I mean, um, I didn't really think that I was striking a gold mine, so to speak, um, a couple of years ago when I started this. And in fact, very few people were talking about uh, the importance of technology um, and media uh, as it related to uh, culture and perceptions of those who are different, um, media and entertainment, how they could be used to create new narratives uh, across society. Um, and so, yeah, very few people were talking about it then. And I think I got lucky. I don't think I was very, um, I was very good at predicting that that would be a, a future trend, but I think I got lucky. And I think f for, for the most part, um, this conversation has started to really pick up. Uh, and luckily I've been in the space long enough that, uh, I've gotten some really good opportunities from it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's unfortunate though, right? It's unfortunate that people are starting to think about the ramifications of technology and media. Um, right. In an ideal world, this wouldn't be an issue that we would have to address. Uh, my organization would not need to be uh, uh, in, in practice, uh, essentially. Um, but the, the reality of the matter is that the, uh, the use of media and technology is, is only getting worse. Uh, with deep fakes, with um, media manip manipulation, with unrepresentative uh, storytelling um, that uh, perpetuates uh, biased and prejudicial uh, belief systems, um, there, there's definitely a, a lot of work to be done. So I'm, you know, I'm lucky to be in this uh, in this 
landscape doing what I'm doing. And luckily there are some really amazing organizations that are also um, in this in this arena doing this similar kind of work and uh, you know, collaboration with them has really been integral um, in, in who we are today. So. And talking about like um, growing and expand and um, make more connections with people or uh, brands and um, people like creatives that, that are doing a lot of great things how important are collaborators? Oh, or perfect, yeah. <laughs> or, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. Co collaborations are, are everything. Uh, everything to everything I've ever done. Uh, you know, when I started, w when you're an individual, right, and you don't have a team, you don't have the, the funding to finance a, a team necessarily, like, how do you, how do you possibly get a, an organization up and running? Um, I think like my, um, one of my, my biggest skill sets, uh, is partnerships, um, figuring out ways that, uh, we can support other organizations who have similar needs, uh, connecting organizations who might have, um, ways that they can support one another and finding a way for pathos labs to be in the mix, uh, of all that, um, yeah, I mean, it's been uh, collaborations. I mean, we wouldn't exist had it not been for collaborations. For example, you know, one of our earliest collaborators, we did a project with Google um, and we were creating a, a virtual reality experience. And this was right after the political or right after the election. Um, and the, the question was, um, how can virtual reality help reduce the, the hatred across political difference? And Google at the time was developing some technology, some VR technology. And so I approached them and said, hey, look, what, what if you give us um, your, your best technology to tell this story? We will give you the content um, that you can share with the world and help promote your VR, um, your VR uh, equipment and, and technology that you're, um, you're building out. You know, th those are the kinds of value uh, ads that are really helpful for, for both parties. Um, just recently, we, we partnered with MTV to do research um, on COVID uh, strategies, uh, on like specifically how can we uh, communicate uh, the coronavirus in ways that motivate positive behaviors in the world. And it was a three-way collaboration, I guess, um, and I was kind of the architect of all, you know, like kind of the, 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 the master trying to figure out what parts kind of go together. But uh, we worked with 45 of the leading behavioral scientists from around the world, ranging from academics at Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, uh, Penn, uh, some of the most renowned universities, um, at least in the United States, uh, Sorbonne in, in Paris, even. Um, and I brought together these academics who were doing research on messaging and persuasion in times of the coronavirus. And I said, hey, look, like we will take all of your research and put it together in a really beautiful uh, playbook, which my friends at um, uh, Ocho Diaz will, will design. So thank you, uh, Nesa and, uh, and Alberto and everyone for, for that help. Um, and we created a beautiful playbook uh, really synthesizing the research of all these academics. Um, and then we partnered with MTV to really get it out there uh, into the world. Uh, and they shared it with folks in the entertainment space, influencers. And so the value to MTV is, hey, look, we'll do all the work and you can put your name on it. The value to academics is, hey, your research will actually have a purpose to society. It will actually reach people. Um, the value... Uh, proposition for for me, I mean, obviously getting the chance to work with these academics and um, and and MTV. So it's it's really about marrying the different interests of all all the different stakeholders that um, that exist out there that are doing um, different work, but could really work together uh, in a really powerful way. And I think that's one of the things that I I, I admire you uh, from you like the most uh, is that. Um, sense of joining parts together that can work and like always in front of like the win-win situation um, and you're not afraid of um, 
I think you're not afraid of failure. Uh, talking about like the lab and exper experimenting things and that maybe uh, ideas can work or all the other ideas cannot work. Um, and that, uh, that feeling that I get from you is that, I don't know, I, I feel like you're, you're not afraid of failure, that you're always pushing forward, um, like pitching for these big uh, companies and, you know, like not being afraid of, of maybe a, a no, but what, what if you, you have, you got like a yes and talking about like people that like me admiring you, obviously, whom do you admire most in the world? That was a really smooth transition there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. Um, I think actually, hold on one second. Let me, let me be right back. I'll get a picture. Uh, to make that point. Okay, well. <laughs> All right, don't worry, I'm back, I'm back. Let's see what. All right. So yeah. this is uh, something that I got for my birthday um, from my dad when I was in high school. Um, and it is, oh man, that, that, uh, yeah. I don't know if you can see it. It's this uh, picture of this older man carrying um, a bunch of sticks on his back. And there's the quote, I don't know if it's gonna be backward for you. Um, it may be, but the quote oh. is, uh, I slept and dreamed that um, life was joy. And I awoke and found that life was only service. But then I served and I found that service was joy. And um, the people I, I really honestly admire the most in the world are the people who do small things with great love. Um, the individual who doesn't get the credit um, or the recognition. Um, the person who is willing to walk a mile with a heavy load on his or her back and smile. Um, that that really touches my heart a lot. And I think, you know, service is key. Um, and I think we're in a world today where we demand so much um, attention and we want all the credit for, for the work. And, um, and I don't know, I think, you know, the people I, I really admire the most are, are the people who aren't doing it for the attention, who aren't doing it for the, the credit um, to, to build up their reputation, but are finding the joy in service and serving others. Um, and honestly, like there are very few people who I come across who, who have that. Um, and I think those are the people who are the most enlightened uh, in the world. And those are the people that I, I really do uh, strive to be like more often. And I, I feel like there's a lot of work that I need to do in order to get there. Uh, I easily get frustrated by the little things and I forget to express joy um, and to feel the privilege of being able to do what I'm doing in the world. I mean, what a, an amazing privilege to be your own boss, um, to be doing the kind of work that you really care about. And seldom do I feel joyful um, or happy even about it. I'm always kind of bogged down by stress and oh my gosh, I've got so much stuff to do and I don't know when I'm going to get it done. And um, so this is framed right next to my desk and um, I took it out of the frame for you. Um, but um, <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think admiration brings also um, passion. And so what are the things you are most passionate about? Yeah, that was that was less smooth of a transition, but uh, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> Time that I have to make, so <laughs> we have to. Run. No, I'm just messing. I'm just messing. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm really passionate about um, about people, um, about um, understanding people who are really different than us um, in college. 
I would spend some time doing uh, kind of empathy experiments um, where the goal was really to try to get to know people who were different from me, um, the opposite uh, of me in, in many ways. Um, and that was really, really powerful. Um, and the lesson at the end of the day from all that work is that, you know, we always fixate upon the differences and seldom do we, uh, focus on what we have in common. Um, and you know, some of those experiments were like, I spent two weeks, um, homeless, um, and was traveling, um, ac across actually Europe from, um, the goal was to go from, uh, Copenhagen to St. Petersburg without spending a dollar. Um, and, uh, spent several weeks on the road and living kind of on the street, um, sleeping behind dumpsters and in train stations and bus stations and, um, and trying to learn, you know, what, what do people who are experiencing homelessness go through? Um, what is that like? What are some of the systemic factors that make uh, the dignity um, really hard for, for people to feel? Uh, when they pass by someone who's experiencing home homelessness, and you know these people uh, were really normal people, and and actually what I what I learned from, uh, and I was lucky. I mean, two weeks is nothing. It felt like a very very long time. Um, it felt yeah, it felt like months. Um, but I I felt actually closer to insanity in those two weeks than I'd ever felt before. And I think you know when you see people on the street who may have some sort of mental illness. Um, it's maybe not the mental illness that got them to the streets, but the streets that got them mentally unstable. And I felt that my, myself. Um, just the invisibility of uh, people walking by and choosing to not look at you. Um, being very uh, particular about you know, uh, you like asking for money or something and then uh, ignoring you. Uh, it's just like so dehumanizing and so difficult. Um, and when no one respects you, it's hard to respect yourself. When no one looks at you, it's hard for, for you to, you know, see dignity within yourself. And, you know, that that's a really hard experience. Um, so, I mean, a, a lot of my, my favorite moments in life have been uh, the moments where I've tested my capacity for empathy and trying to understand those who, who, uh, who are different, who have different lived experiences than I do. Um, and yeah, and honestly, like that, that's what really brings me a lot of passion. And I've been lucky to be able to take a look at um, those kinds of questions through my work. And, you know, the work that we're doing is more focused on technology and in media, but it's really around how do we bring more empathy uh, into the picture? How do we uh, develop more understanding with those who are entirely different than ourselves? I'm in awe. Like, <laughs> and I'm sure, like everyone that's um, here in, in, this, um, in this talk is, is also in awe. So, I mean, we've talked about a little bit of a lot of your journey. I mean, I, 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 I guess there's a lot of things that we can jump in and, and, and be extensive and touch a, a lot of more things. But um, with all this, with all this path that and, and, and your experiences and all that you've been like going through and all of the things that you've learned um right now 2020 does roman has have a mantra do you have a personal mantra like to say to um i do actually i do and i really liked uh I, re I really like that that's a question um that you're asking of the the creatives and i'd really love to hear the mantra your mantra uh first of all but also the the mantra of the other creatives um and the mantras of the folks uh tuning in uh, today um the one for me is um, is one actually I can show you. I've got uh, so in addition to to this, which I framed next to my my desk, I also have uh, the ten Native American commandments. Um, so kind of the ten commandments, but based off of um, the, the the Native people and you know what what their their value system 
um, is just really beautiful, um, very connected to the earth and to other people, um, much more communal, uh, much more intuitive. I think there's so much indigenous wisdom that we forget, um, we don't pay attention to. And so I have this uh, picture uh, next to my desk, it says the, it's the 10 uh, commandments um, uh, for the Native Americans. And, and one of them is, is my mantra, which is, uh, do what you know to be right. And it's really simple, but I think we all have intuitions that tell us deep down what is the right path for us, what we should do. Um, and we hardly ever pay attention to that. Um, or people tell us, oh, that's stupid, or oh, don't leave your job, it's a good job, or you rationalize to yourself, like, oh, what would my parents think, or what would my friends think if I did this? And, and deep down, we, I think we always really do know, if we spend time with ourselves and with the questions long enough, we know what, what, what's right, we know what we need to be doing. Um, and, um, and so for me, it's whenever I, I experience doubt, whenever I'm uh, facing some sort of big dilemma, I, I come back to the mantra of do what you know to be right. And sometimes if it isn't super clear, I just sit with it, uh, sit with it for, for uh, 20 minutes, sit with it for a couple of days sometimes. And the answer always becomes clear. Um, and I know deep down, like that voice inside of me knows the answer. Sometimes it's scary as hell to do uh, what that voice wants. Um, but I think, you know, uh, to live a life uh, where you don't regret what you've done at the end of your days, I think following that voice, um, listening to that little, uh, that little, whatever you want to call it, that little voice inside of you, um, doing what you deep down know to be right in the, the, the deepest, you know, caverns of your soul. I think that that's what will lead people to a life of fulfillment where it would be impossible to have any regrets at the end of your days. Um, so that, that's really what keeps me going. And that's Roman's mantra. Yeah. Um, so we basically, we've been talking uh, just uh, a little bit about you and, and Again, your, your journey, uh, what do you do, your experiences, uh, your interests. Um, so let's move on and, and talk about more about the future. Um, now with all this situation currently happening in the world, um, which has mm. forced ourselves in our homes. Yeah. You know, I'd like to know, what have you learned in isolation these days? And how do you think our lives are going to unfold after all this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I've learned, I mean, there's this really good quote. Oh, shoot, who said it? Um, was, I forget, darn it. But the quote <laughs> is, um, in order to make the current system uh in order to change the current system you have to build a new model that makes the current model obsolete mm. right and i think right now what we have this is what i've learned in isolation is a really unique opportunity right now more so than ever before to radically change uh the way that society is structured to change the way that government uh, holds or change the way that people hold the government accountable. Um, and um, I think that this is the time for collective power um, where I think a lot of people have forgotten how powerful the individual can be. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that I was talking to someone the other day and we were talking about how Things that seemed impossible just a couple weeks ago before the, the whole coronavirus hit, um, what seemed impossible back then now seems inevitable. And that's really an exciting place to be where, um, you know, the orientation on what could be 
is more so prevalent than before. You know, like I think most people, when things are just going normally, people focus on what is, right? What is happening right now, as opposed to what could be in the future. And now I think in times of isolation, and I don't know if it's because we've been forced home where we're more contemplative uh, than we otherwise would be. I think more people now are thinking about not what is, but what could be. And that orientation on the future, I think, is really, really important as far as uh, us developing the strategies in order to, uh, to, to build that future model that we think um, could be better fit for, for, for uh, our con country and our communities um, than the past. Um, so, I, you know, what I've learned is that we, we shouldn't waste this opportunity and things are going to be very different um, in many good ways, in my opinion, in, in some very annoying ways for, for sure. But um, I'm, I'm really excited by the, the individuals who are taking this time to really imagine what could be as it relates to uh, civic discourse and civic responsibilities, as it relates to equity and communities that have been systemically um, marginalized or, or have been affected worse by uh, the, uh, the, the COVID situation um, than, than other communities. And I think uh, now is the time that people are really trying to uh, come up with a, a roadmap for, for, um, for a future that works better for all of us. Um, and so I'm really excited by some of the conversations I've had with, uh, with activists and change makers and entrepreneurs and social uh, leaders who are trying to move that, uh, the, those ideas forward. And how, how have you felt, I mean, during isolation? I mean, like personally? Yeah, I've, I felt, I felt okay. I felt not amazing, um, but not terribly. Um, I was talking to a professor at Brown University yesterday, and she was saying that when things are kind of normal, uh, the average rate of depression is about 10%. And she was saying that early results from some of her experiments, um, she had a sample size of, I think, a couple thousand people, showed that 50% of uh, the people in the sample were, were feeling depressed. Um, and so to see that quintuplative, um, um, that, that, that rate quintuple, I don't know if quintuplative is a word, but that, that rate of depression quintuple um, in a matter of months is, is staggering. Um, so I think we, we all need to feel permission. It's okay if we feel depressed. Um, we shouldn't feel alone in that depression, in that anxiety. Um, one out of two people are probably feeling the same way. Um, I've, I've dealt with a lot of depression in the past and, and luckily I, I don't think that, you know, the, the stress that I, I feel is, is depression, but I haven't felt great. I mean, it's hard to be cooped up inside. Um, it's hard to not have, you know, the regularity of life to see friends, to go to the coffee shop and bars, the places that you frequent, um, and places that bring you joy. Um, but, um, but I, I'm also thankful and, and grateful for the privileges that I do have. I have a roof over my head and, and work and, and I get to be passionate every day about what I'm doing. Um, so that, that's really grounded me uh, as well. Um, and health wise, I've been good. I've had a bit of seasonal allergies, which hasn't been fun. That's why maybe I sound a little nasally uh, right now. It's just my, my nasal cavities are blocked up from the allergies, but spring coming right <laughs> that could be um i was talking with some friends uh just a week um uh, ago uh and we we're talking about that like have you have you been like feeling uh lately or since all of this thing started and we got to the conclusion that it's okay to feel bad i mean it's okay mm -hmm. to feel feel lonely, you feel depressed, you feel like there's no like way out of this, but it's okay also to feel good. And, you know, totally, because totally, um, totally, totally. like personally, I, I haven't felt like super like blue. I, 
and I and I guess that that's kind of like my one of my skills is my resilience. I don't know if, mm. if that comes from like my uh, my country from where I came from, uh, where I come from actually. Um, but I've been feeling like very like I don't know. I have this eager to create and do new things and and mm-hmm. thinking of possibilities and all the new. Uh, ways of doing uh, you know like I, I've been like really pumped about that obviously I haven't felt like like my hundred percent yeah yeah we got to that point that it's okay to feel bad and in, in mm. this case in this situation is totally okay and it's totally okay to feel good as well uh, and yeah. if you, how do you do to uh, the other part or the or your friends or your family or your close ones uh, how do you do if you feel good how do you do to um, or what do you do to uh, lift a little bit to yeah. like you know and so um, and talking about that and a lot of my friends and colleagues that are in the creative industry that most of them have been struck by you know, all this um, blank pages situation that are totally blocked down. Yeah. And mm. Not like flowing as usual. Um, but blank pages, I, I, I like the, I think the <laughs> blank pages are, is the greatest opportunity, right? Like when you have a blank canvas for your life, um, then, I mean, what, what can't you do? Uh, it, it provides full permission to completely redirect, uh, to recalibrate, um, to make new decisions that may feel really weird, to move somewhere, to leave your job or to leave a relationship. I mean, it, it, it opens the door, like change opens the door for, for us to become our truest selves. It gives permission um, for, for us to change because if the world around us is changing so much, then we can too. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's an amazing opportunity that we've been given to really flourish and become, uh, our greatest, uh, self, uh, given the fact that we have these blank pages before us. And, and talking with, with my colleagues, um, there's been something that, you know, like camaraderie gives you that like all people like joining and coming together, like digitally, um, that there's a lot of, uh, in, in our conversations, there's a lot of valuable insights uh, to work. Um, and we think about the future, you know, and what can we do to make things better or how do, what can we do from our side or um, our job? What do, what do we do to make this world obviously a better place? So mm-hmm. how do you see that? creativity and communication can help make significant changes in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would argue that creativity is the only thing that has uh, changed the world. Um, I think it's inevitable. The people who are the ones changing the world are the ones who uh, take the creative approach to developing products or coming up with ideas that the world hasn't necessarily seen before. Um, I think a lot of people are comfortable in the way that the world works, but the world doesn't work for all of us. In fact, it works for very few uh, of us. And, um, and so I think we really rely upon the creative minds uh, to, to develop, uh, to change the world in ways that make it better for us. Um, so I think creativity is, is at, the, the deepest level of, of progress, uh, of, um, of change making. Um, if it's not for creativity, then we're just going to continue doing what we're doing. Um, and we won't be able to find solutions to problems that have been so deeply entrenched in, in a way of being or in a way of thinking. Um, so that is why I'm excited that you're bringing together creatives to to, to answer these kinds of questions. I, I, you know, for me, uh, the folks that I enjoy spending my time with uh, are individuals who are breaking free from uh, the, the standard model of the way life works, who are 
challenging uh, the status quo and offering new ideas, uh, proposing new, new systems that can really make the old system obsolete. So um, I think that uh, not to be over sim uh, simplifying uh, the answer to your question, but I think it's everything. I think creativity uh, is, is everything is in communication too. Sorry to, I mean, I think that's also important is like, how do we define uh, our world? You know, what are the words that we choose? Um, you know, I was reading a book uh, recently and it was saying that a truth is basically something that we've said over and over and over again and you know have stopped questioning to some extent um even some of the scientific realities the 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 uh, the, the theories or not the theories but the um the laws the scientific laws that have become um uh, like proof i mean to take the idea of like we know that the earth revolves around the sun, right? Um, why do we know that? Do we ourselves as individuals have evidence for that? Um, n no, like I, I don't know. I, I, like I haven't personally gotten out my telescope and have m measured you know, the, the movement of the earth personally. But I know that that's the truth. I know that that's the way that the world works um, because I trust a, a sort of communicator um, whether that's parents or teachers, uh, and I, I trust a, a certain communication model. Um, and so as far as communication, like we need people, um, more people who are communicating other ways uh, of being and living in our, our world. Uh, it is then that uh, it is the communicators who will really define what's normal and possible for all of us. So I think like creativity plus communication um, is really what, what uh, our world and, uh, and, and change and progress really depends upon. It is, and going uh, a little bit um, forward with this one, um, for you that you're constantly like in contact, like again, with large entertainment companies and pitching uh, them like your ideas and um, your like uh, proposals and projects, uh, which is is one of the many reasons. Obviously, you move uh, from Denver to LA, um, and that you're always like creating new and better ways of communicating, so that people can relate more, have more empathy, and meaningful connections. Um, what do you think the future will be like for entertainment? Yeah, that is that is the million dollar question. I think so many people in the entertainment space right now have been scrambling. I mean, what are they going to do? Uh, no one really knows. Uh, and I guess like no one really has known for quite a while. I mean, the, the landscape is changing so quickly. We had a partner um, that was focused uh, or yeah, one of our partners was NBC Universal, uh, a pretty big network. Um, in, in the United States and, you know, like streaming um, services are, are taking off and networks are scrambling to figure out whether or not, you know, they're uh, still needed in the entertainment landscape. They're trying to figure out how they're gonna stay alive in the entertainment landscape. Um, streaming services are also trying to figure out, you know, like how do they stay profitable? I mean, a lot of these companies are spending way more money than they're making um, and so I don't think anyone knows. Um, Quibi was a recent uh, company that just uh, got started a couple years ago, but, but launched a couple weeks ago. And a lot of people in entertainment thought that they were going to change the landscape uh, of entertainment. So it's just a bunch of people who have no idea who are speculating what the future of entertainment will look like. But there's no concrete data to really prove what it will look like. And it's changing every day. I mean, we're seeing uh, the, the usage of, of media really changing, even like in, in coronavirus, like a lot different than what people predicted uh, the, uh, and, uh, the entertainment um, usage would, would really look like. So, um, so I'm not totally sure. Um, I'm of the mindset that there are, oh, there's a lot that has yet to be created as far as what uh, entertainment of the future looks like. I think, a lot of um, 
potential around Instagram. You know, I've been uh, brainstorming some, some ideas personally as far as what do interactive Instagram uh, stories look like? Not where you're, uh, you know, liking pictures necessarily, but you're following certain channels um, and or certain accounts and those accounts interact with other accounts and you're essentially able to build, you know, a really robust story with different characters. So, you know, that, that that's one idea that I've been thinking about. Um, uh, largely because so many people are spending hours on Instagram. Um, and I think there's, there, I, I just think there's a lot that, that can happen there. Um, but I don't know to, to answer your question. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of people that are speculating. Um, I think one thing for me that I'd like to see um, in the future of entertainment is more um, is a little bit more awareness as far as how how scripts, how scripted content, how TV shows are affecting our our psyches, whether that's physiological or uh, psychological. Um, a lot of people are watching things, and um, it's it's affecting them. I, I mean, there there's there's studies that have shown that certain TV shows, like Thirteen Reason Why, I don't know if you you're familiar with that show. I mean, it supposedly uh, was was uh, responsible for a spike in suicides amongst teenagers, um, and so. You know, I think that's something that I'm really fascinated by is like, what are some of the behavioral insights that are coming out of uh, academics who are doing research that can really help inform um, how content can motivate positive behaviors rather than negative ones um, and do so in a way that's still entertaining. I think a lot of the folks in entertainment that I talk to are like, oh, but we need to make it entertaining. And that's the that's the, the number one priority. And it's like, yeah, you can do that and motivate positive behaviors at the same time. So that's what I'd really like to see, uh, at least. And how do you see yourself, I mean, in this future of entertainment? I mean, how do you see your company like uh, doing in, in, in this new way of doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to be more uh, of, of service at the kind of the crosshairs between the entertainment sector and the behavioral science sector. You know, how do we how do we bridge? How do we bring these people together to define what uh, what content can create uh, the highest levels of emotional engagement? What kind of content can uh, appeal to different kinds of community members? Community members who may traditionally uh, be um, compelled by very different kinds of uh, contents, you know, can we create content that appeals to them both? Uh, and how do we do so? Um, how do we create content that challenges uh, power dynamics in our country, um, that, that challenges how certain communities have, uh, are continu continuously uh, getting the, the worst of it? Um, how, how does, what, what does that look like? How do we uh, bring equity at the forefront? of um of entertainment where storytellers uh representing certain underrepresented communities are the ones making the decisions and um you know like how do we also change the financing mechanism where the people who are profiting from entertainment aren't just the big banks uh the big um wealthy investors who are able to put hundreds of millions of dollars into uh the next avengers film and make 10 times that you know i think that um, of course, uh, pr privilege and power is maintained when we don't think about all the different elements that go into the entertainment landscape from the actors to the writers, to the directors, to the executives, to the financiers of, of content. So, I mean, I'd really like to see uh, a very all encompassing um, challenging of, of what power looks like. Of course, that's very unpopular and people with privilege at, uh, for people with privilege, equity feels like um, um, marginalization. Um, so I think that that's also an issue is people with privilege don't like to be challenged. Um, so I don't know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities and I'm uh, asking a lot of questions. <laughs> so hopefully uh, one of these uh, will, will, will surface and, and hopefully move the needle forward. Totally. I'm, I'm a bit sad because this is almost over. Um, uh, 
almost in our last question. So I want to make a reminder uh, before we get into our last questions, you guys, um, go to Slido, slide.do, enter the code 63640, and start writing your questions for Roman to answer. So last one, Roman, the overall picture, like, the like the whole grail and it's not the holy grail but how do you imagine uh the world to be at the end of this decade and this is kind of like an exercise of imagination like i mean Ooh, i love exercises of imagination thank you <laughs> for that <laughs> yeah oh uh, gosh um <laughs> i think there's the idea of to a fish in water, what is water, right? Does a fish know what water is, you know? And for me, something I've been thinking about a lot are, is the fact that we are fish, not in water, but in this, uh, this, this, uh, this capitalist uh, framework, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, Capitalism can, is, is obviously, you know, the, the undercurrent of, you know, entrepreneurial success. But I think capitalism is at the core of the, the greatest um, um, the, the, yeah, this is some of the greatest um, societal fragilities, um, the, the lack of access, the, um, the fact that a lot of people are living in uh, extreme poverty, even here in the United States. Um, the inequities are, um, are only uh, increased because of this system of, of, of capitalism that we have just taken for granted. So I think for me, it's people are not, people don't know, like, like fish, uh, like, like the way that fish um, don't know that water exists. I don't think people uh, know that like, capitalism can be challenged. Um, we're just, we've just come to accept it as the reality. Um, and I think very few people are, are really taking a, a hard look at what, you know, uh, what capitalism is doing wrong, uh, the, the shortcomings of it, and different economic models that could actually be better. Um, I, think, I think we've been fed an idea that we need things, we need to buy things to be happy. Um, we need to spend money um, to generate success, like success is based off of uh, a dollar amount. Um, you know, what if, what if that wasn't the case? What if, um, and this is like very imaginative. I don't necessarily think this is feasible, Mesa, but, um, I, I, I would love to see it happen in the next decade, um, where we value things not based off of dollar amounts, but based off of community well-being where money is just a tool. I mean, money has always just been a tool to help uh, with trade, right? Rather than me trade my tomatoes for your uh, apricots, you know, when I don't want apricots because I'm allergic, but you want my tomatoes, you know, like th that's what money was invented for. Um, and for some reason, it's become the thing that we praise uh, rather than just a tool um, that we use. Um, and so, yeah, I'd really like to see society value uh, not money, but rather community well-being. Uh, I'd love to see more uh, society simplified a bit. I think we are overcomplicating things so much. I think people aren't ha happy, but people don't think that they have a choice. Um, so I think once people become aware of how this economic system is the problem, um, that they do have a choice, um then then that's uh and then yeah i think the world will be a better place uh but until then got to keep trying to, uh, to 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 achieve that and to challenge uh the status quo a bit so <laughs> oh, yeah, we have a few uh comments here by your knee uh indeed we only know and are comfortable with what we know we need to expand our learning and yes by local <laughs> Yes, by local. Yes, by local. I love that. It's true. I mean, it's true. We need to support each other. We need to support our communities. And what happened to that? I mean, like we have no uh, commitment to our communities anymore. 
like we used to, right? Like we used to really have our, each other's backs, but now it seems like we don't. Um, and buying local is a good way to do that um, and supporting the people around us who are trying to, you know, make, make ends meet and trying to, to be entrepreneurial and innovative. But yeah, that, that's well said journey. Preach. Awesome. And that, folks, was 2020 Vision with Roman Vakili Tawar. Thank you, Roman, again. Let's move on to the Q&A and ah, the slide. Okay. Oh, let's see. I'm a bit afraid, <laughs> actually. Okay. This, this is a cool uh, slide. Sli that's a cool app. I never I heard know, of right? uh -huh. yeah, it. Is. It was built for um, doing questions, obviously, in uh, like public speaking and stuff, uh, uh -huh. because they uh, found that 70% of people that uh, were attending to these stocks and, 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 and yeah, mm -hmm. and were very like afraid of asking questions. So this is a great way to like erase yeah, that. Sure. And, and just jump into the questions. Uh, I don't feel like everyone's watching you, you know. So, <laughs> <here's one. laughs> how can we get more empathetic as individuals? And for those who run companies, who, how can we cultivate empathy in our organizations? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, really good question. Thank you for whoever asked that. I appreciate that. I think... The, the, honestly, I think the if what a lot of people get wrong, in my opinion, is that they think that they understand someone else. Um, they have spent you know some time with them, or they've watched movies or whatever, and they think they understand someone. And rather than ever think you know someone fully, I think it's really important to be humble and to know deep down that you will never ever understand someone, somebody else fully. You can maybe understand different elements, but you will never understand who they are. You will never understand the lived experience, maybe the intergenerational trauma that dictates how they perceive the world um, and how they react to it. Um, and so I think, for us to be better humans, we have to be humble and saying, I will never understand you fully. And as a result, um, what I can do is just ask more questions, be more curious, uh, come from a place of unknowing rather than from a place of, of knowing. Um, and that is the, the key to being more empathetic. You know, the more questions you ask, the, 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 the deeper you get. Um, as, in, as, as it relates to, to companies, um, how to cultivate empathy in, in your organization, I think, I think companies usually, like people at the top have a lot of ego. And I think that that's really dangerous because when you have a lot of ego as like the head of a company, when you pretend like you have all the, the answers, you know all the answers, um, it, it does not bode well for an empathetic culture uh, within the organization. Um, rather than pretend like you have the answer, pretend like you know everything, I think just deferring to the fact that like we don't know and we will never know. Let's try to ask the right questions. Let's try to ask the right questions to the right people and let's sit with them. You know, one thing, for example, um, not to talk too much, but government, for example, when they're they're trying to deal with the the issue of of homelessness um i have never seen a politician sit down with someone or inviting people experiencing homelessness into their office and say hey look like we don't know uh what what it's like uh we don't know how to develop a solution for this because we've never dealt with a problem um let, let, let's let's have you uh, a part of uh, a, a part of the um, the, the process, you know, what do you need right now? What, what are some of the reasons why you don't feel like you're getting support from the government? So I think for, uh, for organizations to, to run more empathetically, it's really about just deferring your own judgments um, and inviting the people who 
uh, you're trying to support into the into the picture and, and being really curious and asking a lot of really good questions. Um, so so yeah, um, that would be my answer for that first question. Or even speaking up on women's rights, there are never any women's table. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's one thing, right, to say, oh, I've I've talked to a lot of women and this is what they want, but I mean that's good that you've talked to them and you should continue to do so. But if you're at a boardroom and all the people are men, then that all. I missed the audio. What happened? You're, yeah, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm listening to you again. Oh, okay. you're back. Uh, you're okay, back. sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're clearly not um, practicing what you're preaching. You're not placing people uh, in positions of, of power, right? Um, and so I think you got to get off your, your power, uh, your high horse a little bit, invite people into the mix. Uh, let them have the answers rather than yourself um, and, and really listen. I think that that's what's, what's so important. So the next one, how challenging is to bring people that think different together to debate? And how often do people find common ground? Do you have an interesting anecdote? Yeah, another really good question. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, it is really, really challenging uh, to bring people together right now more so than ever, I think. I think people who are conservative don't want to talk to people who are liberal. People who are liberal don't want to talk to people who are conservative, um, uh, at least in the United States. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, after the election, um, I spent several weeks in a rural uh, community in Oklahoma, um, and this was uh, the, one of the most conservative uh, states um, and spent time. It was kind of a, a, a destabilizing experience and I was pretty nervous going out there, but I uh, ended up meeting an amazing family with whom I spent two weeks uh, living with them. Um, I did two trips, uh, one, two, one week each. Uh, and they kind of became my family. They're, they're still Aunt Judy and Uncle Jerry and they're complete opposite. Uh, they have very different political views, um, and um, and it was it was tough, you know, being in their their mix. But like, what what we realized quickly was that we have common values, uh, and we care about us, uh, you know, uh, creating a better community, a better world, and that takes very different forms, obviously. But you know, when you look at interests rather than positions. Yeah, you know, positions being like, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. When you look at interests, like, hey, I really want edu the education system to be better. Or I really uh, am, am afraid that people who are experiencing poverty um, will not get the economic opportunities to lift themselves back up. Then it's, it's a lot easier to connect with people who are very different um, from you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that the couple weeks I spent in, in, in Oklahoma um, were really, really eye opening. And it's, uh, it's cool to be able to find those, um, those points in common with people who you think are the exact opposite from you. Um, so yeah, really appreciate that question. Define what you mean by hatred. There, there are many different types. Which one do you tend to focus on journey? <laughs> A lot yeah. of time. Yeah, good question, Jerry. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different types. Um, and I think there are the subtle kinds of hatred, and there are the overt uh, kinds of hatred. I mean, we really are focused on both kinds of hatred, or all kinds of hatred, um, for that matter. I mean, we've worked with the Southern Poverty Law Center, for example, who uh, they, you know, they do a lot of really important work as far as identifying hate groups uh, around the, the country and around the world. Um, I've done s some work, you know, I had some interesting conversations with uh, an individual who used to be um, the head of the 
Aryan Brotherhood in Mississippi, which was a really, um, and he's, he's no longer a part of it. And, and really how I started to engage with him was he was trying to live a life of love after having lived 30 years of his life uh, being a hateful person. And he had done some really heinous acts uh, against protected groups, um, which landed him in jail. And he spent uh, a decade uh, behind bars. Um, and so we, we've done work, work in, in, you know, that, that's the more overt hatred, but there's also the, the subtle hatred, the, the seemingly inconsequential um, microaggressions that I think really add up and are hateful. Uh, the implicit bias, uh, the ways that um, people make decisions that discriminate around uh, certain groups. Uh, I think that that's hatred, but um, is more so, uh, subtle um, and isn't uh, as obvious. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've, we've been doing a lot of work on, on uh, bias. Um, you know, one of our projects was really focused on placing people face to face in a virtual uh, reality eye gazing experience. Um, and the goal of that virtual reality eye gazing experience was to place people face to face with their biases to place uh, people face to face with individuals who they may not uh, necessarily come across day to day. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's you know, something that we really wanted to address um, through that experience. She asked here, like, it's challenging, but we have to cross those lines of communication. It's the only way we can. Yeah. Become, you will only, you will find most people views aren't out of hatred, but more of ignorance. Most times uh, people don't know how one law, one view affects another person. N ignorance is what divides us. Learning is what unites us. Yeah, N Nisa, you should, you should invite Journey for a, a, a call next time. Um, you should uh, yeah. interview her. She, she's, she's awesome. She's uh, got an amazing Instagram uh, channel. And uh, we connected, uh, was it a week ago? And I uh, was really impressed by the way that she's using her voice on Instagram to challenge awesome. hatred, uh, to challenge bias. Um, and, um, so keep, keep at it journey. Um, it's, it's fun to see you in here and, uh, yeah, meet Nasa, meet journey, journey, meet Nasa. Uh, hope you guys will get the chance to have a conversation. That's totally, of course, I'm really open to it. Uh, last one. How do you practice your empathy on daily basis? Oof. Yeah, I think that is, really difficult. I think you got to be empathetic with yourself. And I, I found myself not be as empathetic or kind to myself as, um, you know, how, how you treat yourself is how you treat others, right? And how you treat others is how you treat yourself. Um, I really do believe that. And sometimes um, I, I really, I really feel like I'm, I'm not as kind to myself or empathetic to myself as I should be. For example, you know, when I'm tired or having kind of a slow day, you know, like I think the empathetic approach would be like, hey, look, like you've been working really hard. You've been staying up late at night trying to finish some of these uh, tasks. I give you permission to just take it easy. You're, you're good. I, you, you deserve it. Um, you're, you're not feeling productive right now. That's okay. Don't worry about it. But I am typically like, no, I can't. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. Got to be resilient. Um, and that's not really practicing empathy with myself. So to answer that question, I, I don't, I, I should practice empathy more on a daily basis. And the opportunity that I do have to practice empathy on a daily basis, which is empathy towards myself, I don't do very well. Um, so I guess that question is I'm thankful for it because it's a good reminder that I need to do that more. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I hope, you know, we, we use ourselves as a, an experiment um, to, to, to feel empathy and to start with ourselves, you know, like, let's be kinder to ourselves. Let's be uh, more understanding and willingness to engage with, uh, with, with ourselves um, and in moments of, of doubt or insecurity. So yeah, th thanks for asking that. Definitely. Well, folks, that was 2020 Visions again with Roman. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, don't forget to follow uh, Ocho Dias, Pequeña Serifa, that's me, Roman Vac on his Instagram handle.
Pan Medina Be who made this incredible illustration of romance. She is the greatest. Uh, give me a heads up. I mean, raise your hands. Amen for romance illustration. I mean, that was like. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> and if you guys are, I mean, like, uh, if you observe really well, like, Roman right now is like an illustration as a background, like the blue <laughs> background, the green t-shirt. Like, thank you, Roman, for the, the You're welcome. Film. Really appreciate it. Like, <laughs> show the illustration. I want to, I want to show forget. how, how well I, <laughs> I matched Where, it. Here, here, here it is. Uh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and don't forget to follow Isra dot uh, He made our main illustration for Twin Visions. He, he's also an amazing artist. Uh, thank you guys for joining again. Uh, next week we're gonna have an amazing guest that is actually between our guests right here, uh, the um, uh, the participants, uh, and the other week uh, we're gonna have uh, another great guest that I'm really like excited to have. Who, who um, are they? Can you announce them? The participants. Um, I don't want to say right now, but just okay. Our, our Instagram account uh, will have all the heads up and uh, we'll make all the updates uh through our social media so thank you again thank you roman again for your time your powerful and valuable insights uh tonight in in this uh chat right here it's, it's a pleasure it's a pleasure thanks for everything that you're doing can't wait so to, to tune into the other uh the other interviews soon uh let's see there's a lot of people like writing Great interview. Thank you for your answers and questions. It was an amazing and insightful. Thank you guys. Uh, stay tuned and take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Practice more uh, empathy. <laughs> Not just <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, we need a, a little bit more of that. Thank you, Journey. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Take care. Good night. Bye bye. Good night.